All right, today we're going to be talking about voting with your feet. Um, this was uh, in section 12 of, the, of your uh, 415 syllabus. Um, but first, I have not been doing the classic album of the week, uh, and so I brought one in today. I don't know what day you're watching this, but anyway, um, it's Jimmy Buffett, Son of a Sailor. This is a, uh, a really good album. Uh, the song itself, Son of a Sailor, is a great song. Um, you should, uh, again, uh, you know, get on YouTube or Spotify or someplace and uh, take a listen to, uh, to Son of a Sailor. Um, Cowboy in the Jungle is also a really good tune. Uh, but anyway, uh, take a look at Jimmy Buffett. Um, there's his uh, Son of a Sailor album, so take a look at that. All right. Um, in 1956, Charles Thibault wrote a little paper called The Pure Theory of Local Government Expenditure. And the title was really a takeoff on Buchanan's, or excuse me, on uh, Samuelson's uh, paper in 1954 called A Pure Theory of Public Expenditures. And that was the paper that introduced this idea of pure public goods uh, that we've talked about, right? And that one looked at the, what was the efficient output, which is the sum of the marginal benefits is equal to the marginal cost. And so anyway, uh, Charles Thibault was taking a look at local public goods, that is the goods that are produced by a local unit of government. In particular, he was looking at perhaps cities, uh, you know, and uh, in, a, in a labor market was what he was really looking at. But it brought up this idea that uh, what happens is Rather than you trying to change the city council or change the mayor through the voting process, if you're unhappy with how your local government is going in terms of what it's spending and what the taxes are and the like, you just, you just leave. You just, you just vote with your feet. Um, and so uh, uh, let me write down here for you, uh, uh, Charles Tibu, and the point is, that people vote with their feet. That is, they just leave. They go to places, rather than tr trying to go through the, the uh, political process, they just move to a place that, is, uh, uh, that they prefer in terms of the government uh, expenditure and tax mix. Um, you, go to, you go to places that are attra you're attracted to, uh, and you exit places that are, uh, that are not efficient. Um, so uh, one of the points about that comes about this is that um, efficient communities will outcompete inefficient ones, right? People will move to those communities that are efficient in putting together, um, efficient communities will outcompete inefficient ones uh, because people will move away from those uh, cities that are doing poorly in terms of how well they produce public goods, they have high taxes and they don't do very, you know, don't have very good services. Um, and the efficient ones will attract residents. And so you have this uh, uh, competition that will result in a more efficient output uh, of uh, public goods, uh, local, local public goods. Um, notice that uh, in Detroit in 1950, just population-wise, Detroit had 1.9 million people in 1950. Today, Detroit has about uh, 673,000 people. You got this major collapse in the population of Detroit over time because what was going on was that Detroit was very inefficient in what it was doing. It was spending a lot of money on uh, labor unions um, and had high taxes where it was trying to take advantage of the idea that General Motors couldn't up and move its factory very quickly. Although over time, General Motors could close that factory down and open up a factory very, you know, somewhere else, which is what happened. Um, and so over time, what you saw was a, uh, a, a flight, from, uh, flight from Detroit towards uh, Oakland County and, the, and, the, and Wayne County and the suburbs around Detroit. People, people uh, uh, left. Um, 
A second thing that to notice is that what you get is you get homogeneity in tastes. That is, people will locate in areas where they prefer that tax expenditure mix. So for an example, um, Ann Arbor might have a lot of high taxes, but they may be producing lots and lots of public goods. And you may decide that, hey, I really, I really want to have a, uh, a, a, a city swimming pool. Um, and I want to have city tennis courts. And I want to have volleyball. Uh, and I want to have uh, garbage pickup uh, you know, every other day or whatever. And so I'm willing to pay taxes in order to do that. That's my preferences. Now, if you recall that um, people generally get the same amount of a public good, right? They get the same amount. Now, we were talking about pure public goods, right? And we were talking about goods being on a continuum between, and we'll talk more about this in a, in a moment or a little bit later on, um, about goods being purely private and purely public. But if you think about, um, you know, if, if Ann Arbor has a public swimming pool, uh, then everybody in, that's a citizen of Ann Arbor can go to the public swimming pool. Um, and if people want to have lots of government provided goods and they're willing to pay the taxes to do that, they'll be attracted to communities uh, that are doing this. And you'd sort of like that to happen, right? That is because everybody that gets the same swimming pool, everybody gets the same fire service, everybody gets the same amount of police service, everybody um, gets the, uh, well, let's say a tennis court, everybody at least has, everybody has the same access to the tennis courts. And so um, if we sort of think about the fact that government goods uh, uh, along that scale of private to purely public goods, a lot of government goods have this characteristic uh, that everybody's going to get the same amount of it. You'd like to have people that have equal preferences for public goods locate in the same, in, in the same place. So it tends to be um, a, uh, uh, an efficient system from that perspective. Notice that this is not only true of local units of government, but it's also true uh, internationally. Now, Timu was talking in particular about local units of government, and we'll come back to that in a moment because he was talking about really places that are within the same labor market. But internationally, people move about as well. Uh, and for example, uh, you know, U.S. is the recipient of this, right? That is, there's lots of people that are trying to get into the United States um, because they prefer to have this governmental structure that's in the United States relative to someplace else. Remember that uh, Donald Trump wants to build a wall uh, across the southern part of, uh, of the United States. Um, and why is that? Well, because there's an influx of people that are trying to get into the United States because they would prefer to be there than uh, whatever country they're, they're, they're from. So, uh, Notice that um, state governments also state governments also have people moving about, right? They also compete, uh, and people, you know, again, vote with their feet. Um, and. Uh, a, a, if the, for those of you that are, might be interested in um, using this as part of your paper, um, there's the uh, United Van Lines. They have an annual survey where what they do is they look at the number of um, uh, uh, trucks and the like that are, are uh, rented 
uh, and measuring how people move from, if you, if you rent a truck in uh, Illinois and you deposit it in Michigan, uh, rather than people getting a van in Michigan and moving it to Illinois, uh, United Van Lines has a, a, a annual survey where you can get an idea of the inflow and outflow across states. Um, if you look, for example, um, uh, uh, Illinois has not been doing too well in terms of its uh, governmental structure, uh, and so they're seeing an outflow of, of people as well. Um, you can also look at annual population uh, estimates and the like to, uh, uh, to get uh, an idea of where people are moving about. But anyway, the United Van Lines uh, annual survey is a is just one document that you can use to try to uh, look statistically at what's been, what's been going on. Um, there's also, uh, to give you a measure of um, what states are like, there's an economic freedom index. Uh, similar to, we, you know, uh, on the, uh, on the uh, uh, box uh, Wolfram folder, I uh, have the um, uh, Economic Freedom of the World Indexes, uh, indices, the Fraser Institute one and the uh, Heritage Foundation one. I believe the Fraser Institute is the one that does the uh, Economic Freedom of the States. Economic Freedom of the States. But uh, you, can take a, you can take a look at that if you're, uh, if you're interested. A, uh, Next point is that, um, as I mentioned before, is that the TIBU model, or TIBU is really trying to look at uh, within a labor market. That is, he didn't want to bring in that um, you have to give up your job in order to move someplace else. That people don't really say, um, gee, I'm not too happy with uh, how, uh, how Jonesville's uh, government and you know, tax expenditure policy is do, uh, uh, doing. So I'm just gonna quit my job here in Jonesville uh, and move to uh, Akron, Ohio or something like that. The TIBU model was really dealing with uh, people uh, within a labor market choosing where they're gonna locate within that labor market. Um, and uh, the, the notice that the um, uh, this system is the opposite, you know, Tibu's idea that th this is an efficient way to do things. You want to have competition. You'd like to have a lot of small governments with all sorts of different choices if you were to uh, allow people to, uh, to respond to the most efficient uh, governments and to move towards their, those uh, places that they prefer in terms of their tax expenditure mix. Um, Regionalization, regional, um, regionalization where, regionalization, where you form regional governments, moves in sort of the opposite direction, right? That is, what that would say is, the opposite direction of what, what uh, T was talking about, that is, um, you want to have a whole bunch of small governments that you can go around and choose between and they compete with one another. If you have a regional government, what are you doing? You're sort of making it into a monopoly. If you make, if you say, okay, here's what we're gonna do. We're just gonna have one big government uh, and that covers the whole labor market, then there's, it's harder for you to move to some place that is uh, is more efficient. So uh, you again, you you would school consolidation, for example, would also uh, be moving in the opposite direction, right? Um, if you say, okay, we need to consolidate all our school districts, so we have a number of our school districts saying, well, we, you know, we shouldn't have a whole lot of small school districts. Uh, it's more efficient to have, um, you know, one big school district. Um, that may say, okay, we have some economies of scale in the production of services, but it reduces 
this ability for uh, you guys to choose which school that you would like, uh, what sort of things you'd like to have from this school or that school. Maybe some schools uh, do, uh, do uh, a production of education, which is uh, cheaper, uh, but it's not quite as good, but you're not that interested because you think you can homeschool them or whatever. Uh, so the, you know, the idea is that you'd, you'd uh, in, a, in a TIBU model, you'd like to have lots of different places that you can, uh, you can choose from, lots of different local units of government. Um, notice it's also difficult for governments to go out of business, as opposed, to, you know, if we're trying to make an analogy to the competitive market system where firms compete with one another uh, and inefficient firms go out of business um, and prosperous firms get larger, um, just one of the things to sort of think about in terms of this model is that it is difficult to find local units going out of business. Right, you don't often hear about that, although we did have the city of Detroit, if this was a big deal a, a few years ago, uh, Detroit went it, it did, in fact, go bankrupt. And uh, the, uh, you know, if you were a bondholder of, you know, held Detroit bonds, then uh, you got a, uh, a haircut uh, from those bonds. But nonetheless, um, uh, it does happen, although states, I don't believe states are, uh, uh, have the ability to go bankrupt. Uh, so in any event, uh, you don't see it happening very often. But if you grew up in California like I did, um, there, were, there were ghost towns. Uh, you know, you'd go up into the mountains and there'd be, you know, some town that uh, sprung up during the gold rush in the 1840s and 1850s uh, or 1860s and then when the gold ran out, town, town disappeared. Um, so uh, it is possible to have uh, ghost towns, uh, so it is possible for so cities to just disappear, uh, but uh, it doesn't happen uh, very frequently. Um, one problem in this, uh, you know, in this theoretical system, and actually a problem in the real world, is what do you do if people can use the services but not pay the taxes, right? Um, what if people use the services but don't pay the taxes? So, for example, um, what if you're the city of Hillsdale uh, and uh, people work in the city of Hillsdale but they don't live in the city, they live in the township. So they don't pay city property taxes or, uh, and they don't have, a, there's no city uh, income tax in the in, uh, city of Hillsdale. There are some, some cities in the state of Michigan are the uh, Uniform City Income Tax Act um, that have, prop, have an income tax, and the way it works is there's a 1% tax on city residents and then a half percent tax on non-residents. So you do collect some, uh, in, you do collect taxes from non-residents if you have a city income tax, but there's only, well, there's less than 30 uh, cities that have such a thing. But nonetheless, what if people uh, uh, work in the city of Hillsdale, they live in the township, so every day they come in and they use up the roads, they drive on the roads, right? So the roads get beat up or whatever. Um, or they use city police services while they're here. You know, if their car gets stolen or something like that, the Hillsdale City Police has to deal with it, or if they're, or, uh, they, they're uh, working at, a, uh, you know, at, at the college, and if one of the buildings burns, the, they expect the fire department to come out, et cetera, right? So, but they're not paying taxes for it, so that doesn't fit in with the TIBU model, right? Because the idea is that do you have a tax expenditure policy and people who, um, who uh, uh, live in the city pay the taxes and they receive the, the government services, but in the model you don't have people using up the services but not living in the city, right? So uh, 
from a theoretical perspective, uh, you have to, to try to deal with that. But, but in an, an actual uh, perspective, you have to deal with that. So how do you do that? That makes it difficult for, our, um, for a number of cities um, uh, to how to, how to uh, deal with the roads. You know, I don't know if you've heard the, you know, the current governor, she won on a uh, platform of fix the damn roads, okay? Um, well, uh, if all sorts of people are driving on the roads here in Hillsdale, but they're non-residents, uh, how do you get the roads, uh, the roads to be paved? Well, uh, one way you could do it is technologically, you could figure out how to do this. That is, maybe uh, at some point there'll be a little uh, thing on your license plate uh, and it will uh, track uh, where you, you know, when you've crossed into the city limit, it'll trigger somehow uh, and it'll know how many miles you drove within the city or something like that. Or uh, you could have some sort of uh, uh, services fee that uh, people who work in the city have to pay through their, and it's collected by their employer. Uh, you know, you can think of ways that you might, uh, might uh, deal with that, but it's an interesting, from this perspective, you know, from this people voting with their feet moving around uh, to cities that, and locations that uh, are efficient in allocating resources uh, in terms of their uh, government expenditures, um, it does sort of, uh, uh, Put a put a crimp in in both the theory and in how you actually actually all go about implementing it. Now, in uh, 1969, Wallace Oates wrote a paper where what he did was he did an empirical estimate of this Tibu hypothesis. That is, um, he tried to empirically test. Tibu. And so what he did was he looked at median house values in New Jersey and said, okay, let's look at the median house value and what should be what? That should be a function of, you know, all sorts of characteristics of the, of the house, you know, how many bedrooms it has and, you know, square footage, et cetera. Um, but also, the tax, the property tax, and he did expenditures on education. So you have local units, uh, lo local school districts, and if you live in the school district, then you receive the educational services, you can send your kid to school there, um, but you also pay the property taxes. And so, what you'd expect under the Tibu model is that if you had high, holding everything else constant, that is, if you uh, think back to Econ 206, um, if you had uh, some regression analysis, um, or if you didn't, uh, what, what, what you would do in, in this regression analysis, you would say, okay, holding everything else constant, can I figure out what the change in any particular variable does to the house value? And so what he found is that holding everything else constant, higher property taxes did in fact reduce housing values, and holding everything else constant, um, increases in expenditures on education tended to increase housing values. And so the, Wallace uh, uh, got moderately famous for uh, his uh, empirical analysis of the Tibu model. Uh, he found that uh, it looks like uh, cities generally tended to, um, to move in the right direction. That is, they tended to, uh, uh, you, what, what would you rather do? You'd, you'd like to spend an extra dollar on, uh, on uh, education if it increased um, the, if, if the, if the property taxes that paid for that piece of edu uh, education, uh, the effect of the property tax driving the, how, the housing value down was less than the, increase in the value from increasing expenditures. And so you'd, you'd keep levying taxes and, and spending as long as it were increasing the housing values. Uh, I actually, my uh, PhD dissertation uh, was uh, along those lines. It was called uh, the theory of the optimizing suburb. And uh, I had some data that uh, looked at the San Francisco Bay Area. And looked at when I uh, looked at I looked at different expenditures on different 
um, um, things that the, the local units of government were spending on and looked at their taxes and looked to see which things uh, might have increased uh, the property values. I had both rental values and uh, I had median house values uh, and looked at uh, where, where this, if it was an optimizing suburb, as I said, you'd spend uh, a dollar on an, an expenditure if the increase in property values from that increase in expenditure uh, was larger than the decrease in the property values from the increase in the, in the taxation. All right, well that, uh, 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 you know, the, so again, to sort of summarize Tibu, um, Tibu had suggested that rather than you trying to um, change the city council because the probability of your vote affecting the outcome or excuse me, determining the outcome is very low, uh, it might, you might, uh, you know, run for city council yourself or you might raise revenue for somebody that's running for city council or mayor or whatever, um, but the reality is uh, it may be easier for you just to move to another uh, city within the labor market uh, rather than trying to operate through the, uh, through the political system. Uh, and that, that has some interesting characteristics to it in that if people do this and you have lots of different cities with different expenditure tax policies, it will create efficiency aspects efficient communities will outcompete inefficient communities and it has the advantage of uh, a uh, from the public goods uh, characteristic that is people who prefer the, that level of public good uh, will tend to uh, locate in that uh, in that particular cities which would lead you to again the idea that um, rather than consolidation of uh, of, uh, of uh, community school districts, et cetera, that you'd want to have lots of small ones rather than a few big ones. Uh, and uh, similarly, uh, regional governments uh, would be, uh, in terms of providing local government expenditures, et cetera, uh, it would be better to have uh, uh, several smaller governments rather than one big, uh, big regional government. Well, another interesting thing about people, you know, voting with their feet in the sense of moving around um, is uh, Thomas Schelling he wrote a paper in 1971 uh, in the uh, Journal of, uh, of Mathematical Sociology uh, called Dynamic Models of Segregation Dynamic Models of Segregation. He also read a really good book called uh, Micromotives and Macro Behavior. Oops, Micromotives. Micromotives and Macro Behavior. Um, very clever, uh, very clever uh, economist. Um, anyway, uh, what Schelling was doing was noticing that when people move around like this, that is they move from one, uh, you know, one city to another, or they move from the city to the, you know, uh, to the, um, you know, to the township, or if, that, if that's the place, you know, not, not all states have townships, but anyway, if you move from one place to another, um, what might happen is you might end up with more segregation than anybody thinks is optimal. What he really did was remember that when we looked at hoteling, and remember hoteling, what did we do? We had, suppose that you had people uh, uniformly distributed along a beach, right? Uh, and that if you had two vendors and people went to the vendor closest to them, that uh, rather than the optimal location in terms of minimizing the total amount of distance traveled by the individual, uh, by the individuals on the beach, we said they should locate, you know, one fourth of the way from either end is where the optimal point is. But what happens is 
If you move closer to this one, you don't lose these people, but you get more of these. And so what happened is what? The two vendors will locate at the median. And that's how we generated the idea of the median voter model, right? Um, but hoteling had shown that, okay, the, the market by itself just allows this, uh, uh, this inefficiency to occur. Schelling sort of brings this up as well in that he says that what happens is that you'll get more segregation than people desire if everyone is allowed to move, okay, if everybody's allowed to move. So if you were to um, move from one, one city to another, or you were to move from one group to another, uh, then you're actually gonna end up with more segregation than people would think is optimal. Let me just explain that. Suppose that, suppose that what you have is a, um, uh, uh, you have 12 people in a room, uh, let's say it's at a dance or something, okay? So let's say you have five girls, let's say it's a high school dance or something, and you have uh, five girls uh, and uh, you have seven boys. Okay, so they're in a group, right? So they're all standing around, you know, like this. There's 12 of them out there. Uh, and suppose that um, there's, nobody wants to have complete segregation. Uh, and suppose that the, but there's one girl uh, that she has to be, um, there has to be 50%. She's, she's comfortable if, there's the same amount of boys and girls, but she doesn't want to be in the minority, right? So, uh, so we have one girl. It's okay if uh, it's 50% uh, you know, boys and 50% girls, okay? But she's uncomfortable if less than 50%, okay? Now notice then that girl, okay, is not gonna be happy here, right? If it were five girls and five boys, she'd be okay. But five girls and seven boys, she's not okay. So she leaves, okay? Now, once she leaves, then notice that's going to affect what everybody else, the composition of the group for everybody else. She leaves. Now what happens? Now there's four girls and there's seven boys. Okay? So, now suppose that there's a, one, one of the other girls, right? So we get the five girls. One's, one's okay if she's 50%, but not happy if it's less than 50%. So she leaves. Suppose then uh, the second girl, her preference is she's okay if it's 40% girls. Right? If it's 40% girls, then she's okay. But notice that what you have now is it's 4 elevenths, right? Girls to boys is 4 elevenths. So she leaves. Now, when she leaves, now what happens? Now there's three girls and there's seven boys. Okay, now I have a girl Keep wanting to not do the eye here. Okay, so uh, then there's one girl uh, who's happy if it's one third. She's okay if she's one third of the group, but less than one third, then then she's she's going to leave, right? So if, so so what's the problem here? Now it's thirty percent, so she leaves. 
Well, you can see where this is headed, right? Um, now what there's going to be is, now what you have is you have two girls and you have seven boys. And now with uh, that one, yeah, so there's two ninths. And then you have one girl who's happy if uh, it's uh, one fourth, um, but which is 25%. But if it's less than a fourth, then she's going to leave. Uh, and so what happens is uh, you're less than uh, 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 one fourth there. And so what happens is she leaves. And then there's one girl and seven boys. And the last girl is OK. Uh, she's OK if uh, it's 10%. Uh, but if it's less than 10%, she leaves. And so what do you have? Um, well, let's, let's make that. She's, uh, if she's okay if, uh, if uh, it's, uh, uh, she's at one, uh, well, yeah, let's say it's one fifth, okay? She's okay if it's one fifth, um, but now she's gone, uh, and so what happens is the, uh, the or, or we could just say it this way. If, the, if she doesn't want to be the only girl, let's make it that and make it easier, right? Okay, uh, she doesn't want to be the only girl. So she leaves. And so what happens? You end up with only guys there, right? Only boys there. And so what happened was you get complete segregation, right? Right? You get the girls over here, right? We'll end up with five girls over here, and we'll have the seven boys are over here. Okay? And notice that you didn't need, you know, nobody wanted complete segregation. It was just that they were uncomfortable if it was below a certain level. Why did you end up with complete segregation? You ended up with complete segregation because you really had what we've talked about before is, right, you really had an externality. That is, every time a girl moved, right, every time a girl left, she changed the composition for the remainder girls, right? The first girl that left didn't say, oh, gee, you know, if I leave, then what it's going to do is it's going to change the mix of boys, girls, and that will affect what's happening or the preferences of the uh, other of the other girls in the group. Not thinking that, right? So what you really have is an externality situation where when one person leaves, then the other person, uh, you know, the mix of the of the uh, system uh, looks different for everybody else. So. If you think of, um, you know, maybe you went to a high school dance. Um, I don't know if it's, it's true today, but uh, in some cases, back in the day, um, you'd go to a high school dance and you'd get there and there'd be, you know, all the girls are over congregating over here and all the guys are congregating over here. When they'd probably like to intermix. But notice what you, let's say you have, uh, five girls and five boys. So the, they're, but they're separated here, okay? So the five girls are over here and the five boys are over there. How do you get so that they'll now intermix with one another? If, what, what do you need? If, if the girls start moving in with the guys, what will happen? That will increase if that first girl moves into, the, into this group of guys, what will that do? That will change the composition for the other girls that are sitting over here, and maybe uh, uh, they, they, the, you know, they're okay if they're not the only one there. So it sort of brings us to that point of uh, 
Who will bail the cat? Who will bail the cat? That is, who's going to be the girl that goes into that group of the five guys? Once she does that, then the other girl says, okay, I'm okay if I'm not the only girl, and she goes over there. Well, once there's two of them, then this other third girl might say, okay, I'm happy if, uh, you know, as long as I'm, you know, more than 20%. So she moves in, uh, and so the you know you'll get the the, the movement that other the, the direction that you that you want it to go in terms of getting people to mix with one another. Um, so what do you do if you're going to have a party? You want to invite somebody that is a outgoing person. Uh, you want to have people that's an outgoing person that'll that's willing to come and they'll be the first one to join that group. They'll be the first one to go over uh, to that group of five guys. Once they're there, then other girls will move in or the same thing might happen on the, on the guy side. I don't wanna uh, be sexist on this thing. It may be that uh, the, you know, the same thing happened. You don't wanna be the only guy standing there with a bunch of girls around you, okay? And so it may be that, uh, you know, so when you have uh, a party, do you want to invite people who are sort of outgoing that don't want to be, you know, that are not uncomfortable being the only one uh, that's in, in the mix? Now, uh, rather than just thinking about, you know, uh, high school dances, um, from, a pure from a public policy perspective, this is a problem, uh, what's called neighborhood tipping. And what is neighborhood tipping? Well, neighborhood tipping was, um, uh, there was a number of papers written uh, years ago about neighborhood tipping. And what it was was how, how do you, um, once a, it was dealing with uh, racial segregation. Uh, and once a neighborhood started to, uh, you know, the idea was that, okay, if a, 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 when a black person moved in, what would happen? You'd start to get what they called white flight. Um, and what was going on, if you sort of thought about it from, uh, from um, Schelling's point of view, and Schelling was, was actually discussing this, um, is that let's say a, a black person moves in and um, you are a total segregationist, right? You're going to move out if any black people move in. So you move out. Well, when you move out, what do you do? You change the composition for the other white people, and the black person moving in has changed the composition for any black people that might want to move in. So when that other white person moves, then the idea is that, oh, okay, um, the other people who are, are not complete segregationists, but pretty segregationists, what will happen is they'll move. Uh, so. The, that white person moves over here, and so what you end up with is more segregation than, than anybody in the whole group would want to have. So uh, white flight, one of the reasons that, that or one of the explanations for uh, the uh, segregation of housing, and of course all you got you can look at lots of data that will show you. Uh, housing is very much segregation, segregated by socioeconomic status, but in particular by race. Um, this, what, what, what explains this concentration of, uh, of uh, housing by, by race? And Schilling's model would say, you know what, one of the reasons this is happening is because of this externality and that when you sell your house and move, uh, then you've changed the composition of the neighborhood for the people that are remaining, and so you're, you end up with more segregation than you uh, might otherwise uh, want to have. Now, notice that there are uh, uh, some things that affect this. Um, what affects this? That's what affects this uh, segregation movement? Well, um, the first thing is uh, Basically, what we've sort of brought up is there's some taste for discrimination. If you have people with that uh, as a uh, that have to be totally the only one, have to be totally 100% whatever they are, women, 
black, uh, uh, Hispanic, whatever, whatever category you want to have. Um, if they want, if, if you have a very strong taste for discrimination, that is you prefer to have a, to be in a super majority or whatever, what will happen is if people tend to have those tastes, then you're going to have, obviously you're going to have uh, more segregation. Um, so if what you did was you persuaded people uh, that uh, they ought to reduce their taste for discrimination, um, then you'd get less segregation. Uh, and, and so that, uh, you know, and there's, an, there's a, obviously attempts to do that, uh, trying to, um, you know, persuade people that uh, you should have, uh, um, you should have a, a, a change in how, how you, um, the, you know, the mix of your, uh, of your community, right? Uh, that you ought to have some uh, uh, dynamism in, in, uh, in how, how things are going about, right? That is, uh, and so um, uh, the, the, the taste, if we, as we try to alter people's uh, taste for discrimination, um, let's say we try to persuade people that diversity is a good idea, right? Um, that people are better off in a more diverse society. Um, to the extent that you can do that and reduce this uh, taste for discrimination, right? That is, uh, uh, if you wanted to uh, persuade people of the benefits of, dis of diversity, of the benefit of diversity, then what would happen is you would end up with less segregation. Um, a second thing to notice is that the amount of segregation that you get uh, will depend uh, on how uh, uh, many of the minority there are. How many of uh, the minority there are. Minority there are, okay? Just to give you an example. Uh, well, okay, the, the smaller the minority, the more segregation. And you might go, well, why is that? Well, uh, just sort of think about it. Suppose that what you had was you had um, uh, 10 tables at the, you know, you had a dining room and you had 10 tables uh, and you had um, uh, three women, okay? Um, now, and let's suppose that, you know, that, so that the, the women are going to seat themselves. You have 10, uh, 10 tables and you have, you know, it's all, you know, the rest are all men. Everybody else is men in the room. Uh, and so where are the women going to sit when they walk in, right? So uh, the first woman comes in. Uh, she sits at, uh, you know, table A. The second woman walks in. Now, if she doesn't want to be the only, she's happy being, uh, you know, uh, uh, two out of 10 people at the table. But if she doesn't want to be the only woman at the table, second woman doesn't want to be the only woman, at the table, where does she have to sit, right? She's got to go sit where the first woman's sitting. The third woman walks in, and she also is okay as long as she's not the only one there, that she's not the only woman at the table. Well, where is she going to sit? She's got to sit by these two. And so what you do is you'll walk in, and as long as, as long as two out of the three women are not comfortable being the only woman at the table, that is, they're okay if there are 20% of the people at the table, uh, they don't have to be, you know, hey, I got a really strong preference for segregation. I want to have, I want to sit at a table with all women. Well, what's going to happen? They're all going to congregate. 
And so uh, when, if you have a, a smaller number of the minority, uh, you're, you're going to get more segregation uh, than if they make up a larger percentage of the, uh, of the population. Um, a third point is um, how, how large you view, view the neighborhood. That is, here's an example. Um, the, larger the, the larger the area you view as the neighborhood, then the less segregation that you'll get. The smaller that you view the neighborhood, the um, more the segregation. So for example, let's say you have people sit, sit at a table, and it's set boy, girl, boy, girl, boy, okay? If you're looking at the boy, okay, if, if the boy views the two uh, seats next to him, as the neighborhood, okay, what do you do? You feel like you're in the minority, right? Because you're one out of three. But if the boy views the four seats next to him, that is, if the boy views that as the neighborhood, feels like in the majority. Okay? So how large you, you know, how, how large you view the neighborhood, that is, um, if you think of, uh, of uh, the city of Hillsdale as the neighborhood versus Hillsdale County as the neighborhood, when you're looking at uh, 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 things that you might segregate about, um, then you're going to get more segregation the smaller the neighborhood than if you view the neighborhood as being larger. Um, I'm trying to remember to switch these out so that they don't get dry. Um, third thing is how far can you move? Or excuse me, fourth thing. Oh no. This one doesn't make, okay, this one's dead. Okay, let's try this. That never happens with chalk on a blackboard, right? Okay, so four. How far can you move? If you can't move very far, if, if, the, if you can't move like two seats over, you can only move one seat over, uh, then you're going to get less segregation than if you can move far away, right? So the, uh, the uh, uh, less distance you can move, then the less segregation. I mean, if you look at the extreme, right, if you can't move at all, uh, then, uh, then you wouldn't be moving in response to uh, the mix of, uh, of uh, people around you. And then the last thing, um, uh, okay, so that's, that's all of it, right? Um, so one way to, to uh, play with this is to um, just get a checkerboard and use dimes and nickels. and play around with it a little bit. That is, vary the rules if you say, okay, we're gonna make it, we're gonna start out with, um, you know, uh, 12 nickels and five dimes, um, and we're gonna make the rule that you can't move more than three spaces on the checkerboard, uh, and you're gonna make the rule that you view the neighborhood as, uh, as the spot the dime is on, uh, and then the, a uh, 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 certain number of, uh, of spots around them. Uh, you can play around with these things and uh, 
and just experiment. Um, it's sort of fun to do, well, moderately fun to do. Um, but uh, you know, if you can you can play around with it, and you can see that this, in fact, uh, how these things work. Um, that is, uh, you know, again, alter how big they make the neighborhood, then then try it again and see how much segregation works if you um, if you change any of those things. You change the percentage of uh, people that uh, nickels uh, have to be in or or whatever. Um, and you can change the, the, uh, the, the how many squares they can move or what, whatever, change any of those, those rules out there, and you'll see you'll get a different, uh, you know, get different result and um, maybe try to see, okay, if I make it so that they can move farther, do I in fact get more segregation than if they can, you know, are limited on, on what they do. All right, uh, a last point is uh, to look at is uh, Buchanan's theory of clubs. And for those of you that have had Econ 402, uh, we spent a good deal of time on that. Um, I'm just giving an overview of uh, Jim Buchanan, his theory of clubs. And uh, he wrote a paper in 1965 um, it was uh, an economic theory of clubs, uh, and um, again, from uh, public finance, we've done some work on this. But his idea is, what do you do about goods that are congestible after a point? That is, they're pure public goods for a certain number, but they're congestible after a point. Okay? That is, Remember that uh, in a pure public good, what? They're non-rival in consumption uh, when we were discussing pure public goods. Um, and uh, so my consumption of it doesn't affect your consumption. There's no congestion. Um, we talked about fireworks, et cetera. Uh, now, what happens if, um, and, and we talked about goods being on a continuum, right, between purely private goods and purely public goods that are, you know, if we put more and more people into the classroom, uh, then they do start to uh, congest. That is, they do start to affect the amount of, uh, of economic or educational services that, the, that we're all getting, okay? So uh, you got two things going. Well, what he said is that you could think of providing these goods in a club. Uh, and the idea is that if you have a good that's subject to congestion, uh, what do you do, right? Given the size of the facility that's producing the good, right? Let's say it's a swimming pool. Swimming pool, okay? So let's say we have a swimming pool, and given the size of the swimming pool, um, we should let people into the club, right? Uh, and how would we let them into the club? We'd say, okay, if a person comes into the club, right, if they're allowed into club, what's gonna happen? The cost per person of the facility goes down, right? So that if, let's say you have your own private swimming pool um, and you uh, decide to um, uh, get together with your neighbor and you guys uh, decide to build a swimming pool and both of you can use it, but you know, let's say there's no fence in your menu. You, know, you put the swimming pool here and your neighbor can just come in and use it when they want. Right? So now the swimming pool costs half as much as it did before. Right? The cost per family has now been cut in half. Um, if I allow three people to, you know, three people to join the swimming pool, or if you have a, you know, you build a club with a swimming pool, um, then if three people can join it, then it only costs one third as much to have the swimming pool uh, as it did if there was only one person. So, but what's the drawback? Right? The benefit per person 
after some point, goes down, right? That is, uh, it may be that at the beginning, they're uh, you know, using the swimming pool. Um, I can use it, and you can use it, and uh, it doesn't, uh, my, your use of it doesn't affect my use, right? Uh, you stay in the shallow end, and I'm in the deep end. Uh, you don't splash me. Uh, and so uh, benefit per person uh, remains the same. But then as we start to get a third person and a fourth person and a fifth person, then what happens is the uh, benefit per person is going down uh, after some point. So the idea then uh, is that the, um, you keep adding people, right? You'd add people, sort of just makes sense, uh, as long as, the benefit per person is going down less than the cost per person is going down. All right? That is, if we could put in the dollar amount what the reduction in benefit per person is, um, if by your coming in to the swimming pool for each of us, our benefit per person has gone down by a dollar, but the cost per person has gone down by two dollars, we're going to let you in. And so you keep letting people in, right, as anything else, so long as the marginal benefit is bigger than the marginal cost. Well, what's the marginal benefit to us of your joining the club? The marginal benefit to us of your joining the club is that the cost per person has gone down. Uh, what's the marginal cost to us if you're joining the club is that there's a reduction in benefit per person from, from doing that. So given the size of the facility, that is given the size of the swimming pool, um, we'll just keep letting people in as long as their reduction in the benefit per person from their crowding uh, or congesting us uh, is less than the reduction in the cost per person from doing that. Now, given the number of people, then what you ought to do is, given the number of people, what are you going to do? You're going to increase the size of the facility and what's going to happen? As you increase the size of the facility, what's going to happen? The cost per person goes up. but so does the benefit per person. So given there's 20 of us in the club, how big should we make the, the swimming pool? Well, if I increase the size of the swimming pool, then the cost per person's going up. But on the other hand, we don't crowd one another as much. There's no conge less congestion. So what will you do? You'll keep, you'll add, to the size of the facility as long as the cost per person is increasing less than the benefit per person, right? The benefit per person is going up as we make the facility size larger. The cost per person is going up as you make the, uh, uh, the uh, facility size larger. Uh, and as long as the benefit per person is going up bigger than the cost per person, uh, then uh, we'll keep adding people. Well, if you do the algebra of all this, uh, which you, you can and did, uh, if you do the algebra from all this, uh, what are you going to have? You're going to have two equations and two unknowns, which you can solve, right? So what do you do? You, you can solve for the number of people in the club and the size of the facility. Um, notice that if there's uh, lots of congestion, you're going to go towards a club of only one person, right? If, you, if, there's, if there's no congestion, then what happens is the, you know, 
given the, the size of the, uh, of the uh, facility, the fireworks display or whatever, uh, then you'll just keep adding people, right? Because the, 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 uh, it's non-rival in consumption. Uh, and so pure public goods, uh, you'd want you know, lots of people uh, uh, to, uh, uh, you know, to be in the club. Uh, to be able to watch the fireworks. Um, and if it's, there's lots and lots of congestion, then you're probably going to move towards uh, a private good. All right, well, that concludes uh, our discussion of the, uh, of, uh, the uh, people voting with their feet. Uh, and uh, we'll have a final lecture, uh, and that will uh, be on constitutional political economy. Um, and so with that, I will hope you have a have a uh, you know a good and safe uh, experience uh, out where you are.